What do The Shining, Star Wars, and Shrek have in common? Church music. Specifically, this church music. This is Dies Irae, a Gregorian chant historically associated with funeral services, formerly called a requiem. In a contemporary context, film composers love to use it to reference death, doom, or danger. This musical fragment reveals the many faces of how a film soundtrack can be used. The core substance of the music in all three contexts is identical, but the way the composer transforms it allows it to be mysterious or mournful or exciting. I'll take care of the dragon. But some recent films, notably Guardians of the Galaxy, have been successful in incorporating non-original music into their soundtracks. This raises the question, is original film music really necessary? While non-original music has its merits, I'll be arguing for original music as aesthetically valuable to the development of a film, looking at films throughout history and focusing on a few in particular. First, we're going to lay a bit of foundation regarding the structures of music. I'll be using the terms note, motive, phrase, and theme to convey musical structure at different scales, with the help of an existing musical example. Naturally, the smallest possible subdivision in music would be a single note, let's say C-sharp. You could compare an individual note to an individual letter in the English language, the letter Y, for instance. You can imagine what kinds of words and phrases might include the letter Y, but it doesn't by itself convey any function. Next, we have a motive. A motive contains multiple notes strung together, forming a melodic trajectory with distinct character. Continuing the language analogy, a motive would be more like a morpheme, or a single word. This is the smallest division of music that still conveys discernible meaning. Instead of just Y, now we have U. The brevity of the motive opens the opportunity for it to be altered, transformed, and reimagined in various contexts, while still containing the same basic idea. Changing some pitches or rhythms while maintaining the general structure allows the composer to use it for cohesion and support a musical narrative. One level above, there's the phrase. Phrases comprise multiple motives, or a single motive restated in multiple ways. Even without an understanding of sheet music, you can see the contour of this melody, and notice that it consists of essentially the same content repeated twice, slightly differently. A phrase would be equivalent to a phrase or clause in English. It might constitute a complete thought, but often leaves room for interpretation or elaboration. Finally, we have a theme. Themes tend to consist of multiple phrases, or similarly lengthy bits of musical material. This is the full melody from a violin concerto by Tchaikovsky, from its first note to the beginning of the next distinct musical section. A theme conveys a complete musical thought, plenty of content to be transformed and developed later, but also a locally closed loop, with less ambiguity than its constituent phrases or motives. These subdivisions pose both challenges and opportunities for composers of original film music. Oftentimes a composer will construct an elaborate theme that encompasses a character, setting, or subject. But a skilled film composer must not only compose themes that express the narrative, but also shorter phrases and motives that quickly set a musical scene. This particular skill is exemplified in Richard Wagner's 19th century opera series, Der Ring des Nibelungen. In these operas, he employed a musical tool called a leitmotif. A leitmotif is a version of a motive, one of the structures we talked about earlier. A leitmotif serves a special function, though. It represents a character, object, setting, or idea through music. In Wagner's case, this includes remarkably specific things like golden apples. Golden apple, 
but also relatively broad ideas, like fate. As we covered before, the brevity of a motive allows the composer to transform it to their advantage, making it musically malleable. This is particularly useful in the case of leitmotifs, where the composer can alter some aspects to create a new motif for a related subject. This is the end of the leitmotif Wagner creates to convey death, constructed with the core of the fate motif. These leitmotifs allow Wagner to create musical associations between narrative ideas and lay the foundation for what would become the film music of the Western musical tradition. One of the earliest films that had a profound impact on the trajectory of soundtracks was Metropolis, in 1927. It took these Wagnerian strategies and applied them to film. Being a silent film, the efficacy of this soundtrack is crucial. The opening of the film greets us with this music. This music represents, well, Metropolis, but also general concepts of civilization, innovation, and creation. Characterized by these leaping repeated figures and this upward crawling figure, it's impossible to miss when it appears later in the film. <music> Settings aren't alone in receiving attention, though. One of the central characters, Maria, bears her own musical identity. And when next she makes her appearance, the composer takes advantage of the groundwork he laid before. What I love about this use of Maria's theme is that we know who is about to appear without any character hinting at her presence. We as the audience know exactly who Fredo is looking at because we know this is Maria's music, it must be Maria. Metropolis wasn't alone in following this Wagnerian tradition. Eleven years later, in The Adventures of Robin Hood, the composer gives us this music to specifically represent Robin Hood in action. <laughs> Here it appears again, but in a more brief fashion. Korngold is taking advantage of the structural framework we viewed earlier. He has a fanfare that represents Robin Hood, but needs it to be just a bit shorter for this scene. Because of the length of the original fanfare, he can cut out a bit while still leaving it recognizable. But of course, these films are both over 80 years old. It helps to have a more contemporary example, so let's take a look at How to Train Your Dragon. In the first scene of the film, we hear this music. This is Burke. It's 12 days north of Hopeless and a few degrees south of freezing to death. It's located solidly on the meridian of misery. My village. In a word, sturdy. And it's been here for seven generations, but every single building is new. We have fishing, hunting, and a charming view of the sunsets. The only problems are the pests. This is Burke, but this is also effectively a theme that represents Hiccup, the protagonist, and the other Vikings of his village. As the film progresses, Hiccup tracks down Toothless, the titular dragon, and we hear this music during their first encounter. <laughs> This is Toothless's leitmotif, 
This is perhaps the clearest statement of it, but it reappears later in a very influential way. After befriending each other, Hiccup and Toothless go on what is best described as a test drive. Right as things seem to be completely falling apart, Hiccup and Toothless regain control, and we hear this. This is a theme composed by combining the musical material designed for each of these two characters. Initially separate, here they appear together, after becoming two parts of a cohesive whole. This is the exact storytelling benefit that an original soundtrack can take advantage of. Earlier, I mentioned Guardians and their use of non-original music. This music is used diegetically, meaning it exists from the character's perspective. There's something to be said for that, but Unfortunately, it lacks the kinds of storytelling benefits that original music enjoys. Take this scene from near the beginning. You might remember what song Quill dances to here, but that song, Come and Get Your Love, only appears here. Like many of the other songs on the soundtrack, it appears only once. It's great music, but it doesn't tell a story in the same way that these other examples do. Replace Come and Get Your Love with any peppy rock or disco song from the early 70s, and it doesn't make a difference. The musical cohesion remains virtually nil. The same can't be said for these films. Their narratives benefit greatly from the original music underlying them, and breaking that cohesion with the incorporation of unrelated music would tarnish the soundscape. You might cite this as a downside of original music, a tenuous tapestry of interwoven musical ideas requiring skilled craftsmanship and immense investment to pull it off. I, on the other hand, would look at these and think it's no wonder that one of the things we remember so well about our favorite films is the music. And if our memories are going to make room for film music, we owe it to ourselves for it to be good. <laughs>